At Geese College of Business, we are truly revolutionizing how online education is delivered. Our faculty and students thrive in this one-of-a-kind global classroom. Being able to collaborate with people across the globe and to learn from top-notch professors has been completely revolutionary. One of our strategic priorities is to democratize education. I think the cool thing is that you can truly participate from whatever you are. This is both if you're starting questioning your career to if you're a professional and you want to hone your skill, this is it. This is the place to be. You have so many great experiences in front of you, so think big, think really big, because we are the greatest place on earth for purposeful leadership. The next generation of business leaders will come from all corners of the world, and now they converge here at Geese Business. Hello everybody, this is David Scharfenberg. I'm the Boston Globe's ideas writer, which means that I get to talk to lots of smart people about interesting and important topics. Um, today we'll be talking to three great panelists about how the coronavirus pandemic has shaken up higher education and what it could mean for the future of college in America. Um, but before I get to those great panelists, I'd, I'd like to start by introducing Dean Jeffrey Brown of the Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois, which is sponsoring this event. Uh, Dean Brown uh, has degrees from a couple of local schools here, Harvard and Brown, uh, Harvard and MIT, I'm sorry. Uh, he's got some local ties here. I hope uh, Cambridge treated you well, and I'm going to pass it off to, to Dean Brown to start. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and, and welcome to everyone. And yes, Cambridge treated me extremely well. I still love uh, that part of the country. So on behalf of everyone uh, at the University of Illinois Geese College of Business, I'd really like to welcome everyone to our conversation today. Uh, as you know, the world of higher education is changing quite rapidly, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really uh, just served to accelerate the pace of change. Like almost every college and university across the country, and for that matter, the world, uh, we at Geese finished the spring semester remotely. Uh, that's not something that's easy to do, especially on uh, virtually no notice. And in my mind, there's a difference between an education that is intentionally designed to be online and take full advantage of the capabilities of that medium versus remote learning, which is what most schools uh, reverted to in the spring. Remote learning is what I, the term that I use to describe the situation where an instructor takes their face-to-face -face class and all the material that was designed for face-to-face -face instruction and simply delivers it through a camera. And I think we know that that's not the best approach. Um, most colleges were scrambling uh, to put this together in the spring and by and large, I think there was a significant amount of disappointment uh, with, with that experience. But as colleges prepare to welcome students back this fall, um, most universities and colleges are spending part of their summer really gearing up and training people how to do online education the right way. And I think online education is here to stay. Uh, we are certainly imp implementing this fall a hybrid teaching model is what we have announced which is going to use a mix of online and face-to-face and -face classes. And some of our courses will be moving entirely online this fall. Uh, we're fortunate in the Geese College of Business that we have the classroom technology that allows us to synchronously teach students in class and online at the same time, which gives us some increased flexibility with scheduling and actually allows us to do more in-class instruction than we otherwise would be able to do. And universities and schools all across the country are dealing with the same these same issues, which is how do we continue to, live a, to, to deliver a really high value education while maintaining social distancing and, and keeping our uh, community safe? The answer in my mind has a lot to do with implementing high quality and engaging online education. And um, really to do that, I think you have to build them from the ground up with the median in mind and with the learner in mind. So the even before the pandemic, I believe that online education was showing signs of very rapid growth, and especially in the graduate space, and particularly in the business graduate space. We're able to take students from all over the world, different stages of life that are looking to advance their education, but they can't necessarily come to campus to do it because of jobs and family and, and travel restrictions. Uh, there are many more who may not have thought they would ever need an advanced degree, but now in this situation, due to furloughs or, or uh, a down economy, uh, they're looking for new opportunities. 
And in these uncertain times with social distancing combined with travel bans and visa delays, the ability to provide affordable and flexible access all around the globe is really important. So we offer uh, an online MBA for only $22,000. We also offer a master's in accounting and a master's in management uh, that provide, I think, extraordinarily high quality flexibility as well as very high engagement with fellow students and faculty and I believe this is a model that we're going to see adopted more and more. Uh, the, best the best online programs out there are taught by the leading faculty, have highly engaging live sessions, group projects, true office hours, all the things that uh, we're known for doing on campus uh, and almost all of those can be delivered with planning and adaptation online. So the, the key to remember is a great online education is not just putting a PowerPoint presentation and delivering it on Zoom. You have to be very intentional about it. Uh, and that's what really makes it a valuable resource and, and something that's quite personal, uh, purposeful. And I believe that if we all do it right, online education can be at least as impactful, maybe more so than traditional in-person uh, education. So. I really look forward to hearing from today's panel. We're grateful for the opportunity to uh, host and sponsor today's event. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to David. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dean. Really appreciate it. Um, so uh, a few things for our audience to know before we get started. Uh, first, you can use the Q&A tool that's hopefully appearing on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And we hope to get to some of those later in the hour. Um, also, everyone in the audience is muted and will not appear on video at any time, so you don't have to worry about that. And finally, this event uh, will be recorded and distributed afterward if you want to catch something you missed or, or watch again. Um, so now let me do a brief introduction of our panelists here and we'll get started. Um, first, we've got Paul LeBlanc. Uh, he's president of Southern New Hampshire University. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, we've got Amy Glassmeyer. She is a professor of economic geography and regional planning at MIT. Hello, Amy. Uh, and finally, uh, Samantha Herrera, who is a student at the University of Chicago. Hi, Samantha. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, and thank you all for your time. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Samantha, if I could, just to get the students, student experience here. Um, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about what you told me about yourself. You're 19 years old. You're from uh, North Jersey, uh, first generation college student at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, you told me you were at school this past year, making friends, uh, studying at the Starbucks at the bookstore, hanging out downtown um, in Chicago. Then the virus hits, uh, and everyone's scattered. You're back at home, you're kind of looking through your laptop. <laughs> um, and I want to ask you in a moment about online learning and what, was, what that was like. Um, but college, of course, is about more than that. So. First, just tell me a little bit, if you would, about the social aspect of uh, being in college uh, at the time of the coronavirus. Was it lonely? How did you connect with your friends online? What was, what was that like? Yeah, well, first, thank you for having me. Um, the social experience definitely took a turn uh, for you, Chicago. Um, typically before, like, you would see your friends at the library, even if you were, like, so heavily focused on studying. Um, but now going home and having to take classes online, it's like completely changed. Like you no longer have the sphere of the classroom. Now it, on Zoom, it was the sphere of like, um, like your green screen background on Zoom, trying to make it engaging, trying to make it um, so that you could discuss with your classmates and feel like as if though you were in a classroom. I know we would be put into like Zoom groups or Facebook groups and have to like try to discuss any kind of educational topic. Um, but it was a real struggle because, you know, it's, it's completely different social cues uh, as it would be in person. So, you know, just like kind of awkwardly smiling and like trying to make it as realistic and as in person as possible. Um, but yeah, I think despite all of that, it's definitely given us an opportunity to like uh, organize and unite in so many different ways through the Internet, through FaceTime. Um, and it's made any kind of reunion, online or not, um, much more intentful. So, yeah, that's been a bit of the social experience. That's great. And I think we can all relate to that in, in some way or another as we kind of log into our offices or try to talk to family uh, from a distance. Um, I think you told me that you were actually kind of, when you're taking these classes, you were actually moving from room to room in your house to try to feel like you were kind of shifting around classrooms. Is that, is that right? Um, yeah, I would try to spend some class time in my room, 
feel like that would be one classroom. Then I'd go to the dining room. I'd be like, okay, that's my little walk of the day. Um, get some sort of exercise in. Sometimes if it were nice out, I'd go outside. So at least it would feel like I'm somewhere else or like that I'm walking through campus, although it's just my house in my pajamas. But yeah, something of that feel. Great. And was there anything, um, obviously there's some, some struggles with, with Zoom, but was there anything that felt um, surprisingly good about the experience? Anything uh, positive in terms of your classroom experience, something you might not have done otherwise? Yeah. Um, well, in terms of the classroom space, I think teachers were like forced to um, kind of be as engaging as personal as possible just because you don't have that in person type of experience. So I know one professor of mine, he would do daily check-ins. He would use his Zoom office hours as a space to talk about how you're feeling in this like whole pandemic. And so that was the way in which Zoom could have been like, or was a good opportunity. I think besides the classroom, um, because everything's had to stop and we've all been forced to kind of reevaluate our, any bureaucracy or any community we're involved in, We've had to see like if our structures are secure enough, if there's any issues that um, we have to reevaluate in order to be involved in now that we're at home and we have to do everything through Zoom. Um, and we've had to like, as a community at UChicago, had to redefine like what it is to be a student, what it is to be someone living on campus, off campus, international student, um, and really reevaluate um, our sociological differences and see how we can come together to fix some of the holes that we've had to bring to light in this pandemic, such as like financial aid issues and policies, um, student status, and things of that. So I've been seeing tons of unity despite us being physically separated. So that's been a really great opportunity. That's interesting. Um, that's a good segue. Uh, I wanted to, to ask um, Professor Glassmeyer a couple questions about uh, from a professor's perspective, what it's like to, to teach in this environment, what she's learned. Um, you're a professor at MIT. Uh, you are known, among other things, for your living wage calculator, which breaks down the cost of living in cities and counties and states all over the country. Um, you were teaching from home uh, this spring. I think you told me with a cloth bubble around you, a couple of headsets, uh, you really kind of leaped into this. Um, you described this remote teaching experience as really transformative for you in terms of how you'll teach going forward, both in this environment and when, if ever, we re return to kind of normal teaching. Tell me a little bit about that. What did you learn? How will your uh, teaching change going forward? Um, <clears throat> so the, the first thing to say is teaching online is incredibly intimate. I am closer visually to the, my students when I have them on the screen than I ever am in a classroom and in some ways you feel a, a, just a greater connect i felt a greater connectivity these were people who would be more than a student in a in a room where i might be 10 or 15 or 20 minutes feet away from them they were real people right next to me and that had a a, a big effect on me personally because i I've, I felt like I had to let them know who I was. That was essential for us to cooperate. And it, and it wasn't just that they were going to have to do it. It was something that I had to earn. So that was an interesting experience. The, the, the rapidity with which we left campus was uh, astounding. So Wednesday, the news came out and by Friday, we were all off. That was it. We, I remember coming home, coming back to campus that weekend. I took my chairs and my monitors and I put them in my car and I knew I didn't know when I was going to see my office again. And I, it was like go, launching off in a boat and you have a sail, but you're not sure where you're going to go. And you have to get all that stuff at home and then get connected and things you never took the time to learn became essential in being able to function. Uh, and uh, luckily, um, in my environment at MIT, and I think I told you this, it was, it was we were really well resourced. And that, some of it is because we had already got an online program. We had uh, priors of how do you put up information and then have people use it on a global basis. Uh, but the fact that there was constant feedback from colleagues and from outside and inside made you feel like you could do it because if you ran into trouble, somebody would get you out of it. And if you ran into trouble, the students wouldn't hold you to having made a mistake. And so it wasn't 
it, it didn't feel like, the, I thought that the pressure would feel much greater. It didn't. It was really more of an experience of uh, personal development. That's interesting. And talk about some of how you shifted your teaching and what you might hold on to. I, I, I think you told me, for instance, just to kick it off that, you know, in Zoom, sometimes a lecture for an hour might not work. You had students perhaps work in groups more, uh, that that's something you'd like to hold on to. What are the advantages of online learning and, and, and what would you like to hold on to going forward? I think that the uh, forced intimacy allows you to really have a much better sense of how people learn and, and how much they learn differently. And by developing relationships individually, you it becomes a co-created experience. So it's not just out and then maybe in, it is out and in and in and out. And, and I felt that the, the highest degree of accomplishment was when you had somebody engaged talking with you animated just like they would be uh, and that it wasn't professor to student it was really two people talking about something that really mattered um, i also because of the kind of class i teach it's an undergrad and a grad student class but the majority of the students were undergraduates in the class and substantively none of them were engaged in the topic none of them had ever heard of many of the things that i was formally used to teaching about and so i really had to think about okay so how am i gonna how am i gonna do this how am i going to make this topic relevant and not and not do it just because it's what i think is important it was it was important for me that they discover that it's important and they did over time and we did a lot as time went on well we always had a check-in so as samantha said there was always how are you doing where are you what are things happening in your you know around you uh, but i would also use people's environments to feed information into me about where they came from who they were um, how they might be experiencing what it was like to go back home and that was that was really uh instructive because we don't necessarily get that close to people to have some sense here's my bedroom my parents aren't here or my sister one one of my students said that his he and his sister were about three years difference in age and he said you know one of the best things about this experience is i'm getting to know my sister like i didn't know her we you know i was a little bit older i left she wasn't there or she was doing something else he says and now because we're forced to be together you know we're talking about it and so that that was really important the the capacity to let people be on their own to work together, that also was interesting because I didn't know what was going on, right? And if you're a control freak and then you send people off into a room and they go off and have a conversation without you, you don't know if they're talking about you or not. <laughs> you know, and if you're self-conscious, you're thinking, well, I wonder what, I wonder if this is really working. And, uh, but they always came back and they always surprised me at the level of sophistication of the conversations they were having. And so that immediately made it possible for me to build off of it. I could get into their heads, I could see where they had gone, and we could, we could move out uh, into other um, material. And then finally, at the end, um, so th imagine, they didn't know anything about the subject. They were taking this class because it fit into their schedule. And they had known nothing about me, and then all of a sudden we're in forced uh, inclusion and um, I gave them an assignment at the end of the class and what they basically had to do is one day read something and discuss it as a group and then the next day they had four days it was their final project it was to actually go in and find other sources of information about the particular city they were working on and explain why that city had gone through the trauma that it had gone through and transformed uh, into a, a state of economic uncertainty. And every one of them surprised me. I was surprised. It taught me how much they had gotten out of the class, which was just a joy, and it was complete shock. But it also taught me uh, how systematic their minds worked, so that it, it wasn't just random information that they got. They went and they got various things and they told a story that um, was a very compelling story. So I felt in the end, um, well, they were a lot smarter and a lot more together than, than I even yeah. knew. Great. So lots of glitches in online learning, but it sounds like uh, some advances as well. Um, Paul, I want to turn to you. You're the president of Southern New Hampshire University. Um, your school is best known perhaps for its 
big online operation. You've got about 130,000 online students. You're one of a handful of so-called mega universities that have emerged on the scene in, in recent years. Yep. And I want to talk to you about online learning in, a little bit later. Um, but you've also got a traditional college campus in Manchester with traditional college age kids. And you're embarking on a really interesting experiment this coming school year um, that may have ramifications for uh, where uh, higher ed goes in the future. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and what it says about where higher ed is, is headed. Yeah, we, we've set out to see if we can take our tuition for our campus, our traditional residential campus from 32,000, that's not room and board, just tuition, 32,000, which by the way, for private schools isn't even that high in the sort of overall scale, but to bring it down to $10,000 a year. And the interesting thing is a lot of people heard that and said, so this is a response to the pandemic and almost sort of more powerfully the recession and the levels of unemployment were saying, it's like, actually, no. We announced this back in October, well before the pandemic, and we did it with an eye towards launching these programs by September of 23. When the pandemic hit and we saw massive levels of unemployment, just to put that in perspective, 8 million unemployed during the last recession, which was really bad, 20 million unemployed today. So when we looked at that and we thought about, you know, we had set this set out in this, in this path because we thought too many of our students, the students we like to serve can't afford us, then we thought, you know what? Today's high school seniors and juniors can't wait. Like we need to do this faster. So what we did was we announced that we would set out for September of 21, two years earlier than originally planned to be out in the world with the $10,000 degree. So that's the work that's underway with a massive task force and work streams and faculty and staff really hunkered down and pulling from our online and pulling from our innovation teams and really trying to distill all the learning we've done thus far. So it's a, it's a big, complicated task, but we often say that my particular institution serves that 50% or so of Americans who say they would struggle to come up with $400 for an unexpected car repair. Like that's who's being left behind. And, and, and we see it. We see it in the inequities. We see it in you know, all of the things that have been much uh, debated in higher ed. Got it. And, and I wanted to focus particularly on uh, what you're planning to do um, not just this coming year with the obvious um, virus issues, but going forward, you talked about a sort of hybrid system where even people who are on campus will be doing some mix of online learning and in-person learning. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we, and we sort of channeling here, my old friend and a former trustee, Clay Christensen, famous Harvard Business School professor who passed away last fall, but we really use his jobs to be done notion. And I, you know, their campuses do two jobs for traditional age students who come there. So one is it's amazing educational experience, but another one is it's amazing developmental experience, but what I would call a coming of age job. And, and I just thought, listening to Sam talk about kind of, you know, how, what part she misses. She misses both jobs, right? She wants to be in class, but there's the, we all know this, who, all of us who have been lucky enough to have a traditional residential experience know that so much learning, so much power, so much development happens, captaining a team, being involved in a student organization, organizing a protest, staying up really late in the dorm and debating, being with people who don't look like you, whose backgrounds are different from you, right? And that's so hard to replicate in an online environment. But we're gonna to try to treat those jobs somewhat separately. We know they work best when they're in harmony, of course, um, and say, what are all the ways that we can give people their academics, which could include um, wholly online, like live on a campus, have all of that experience, but take your classes online if that works for you, a lot of, for a lot of students, it doesn't work so well. Hybrids are all fully face-to-face, -face, but probably delivered in different ways than we do today to drive out cost. The second piece will be looking at what are the ways that we give people that coming of age experience? And we've been operating with long historical assumptions. For example, for that second job of develop, that developmental job, we know that a lot of seniors say to us at the beginning or the end of their junior year, beginning of their senior year, I'm good. Like, I, I kind of had the campus thing. I'm ready to move off. We have students routinely withdraw from the traditional campus, go into the workforce, and finish their last year at the more affordable online offerings we give them. So students are themselves kind of hacking our system. They're hacking the world that we've, those sort of models we've created. And we might say, look at, we still need four years of Amy and her colleagues and the amazing education they provide 
But for that coming of age developmental piece, maybe three years is enough, maybe two years is enough. Maybe it isn't even constant. Maybe it's I'm gonna be on campus for one semester and away for a second semester. Northeastern does this very effectively with their co-op program. So we're gonna really try to play with those models. And there's a third dimension, David, that I haven't uh, talked about, which is we really wanna look at broader systems questions. So higher education is largely still an analog world, right? We do a lot of things physically. It takes, you could get online tomorrow and get a $500,000 mortgage in a relative heartbeat compared to how long it would take Samantha to go through the financial aid process to get $5,000. Like this just makes no sense. So what processes, what systems can we move to a much more digital, efficient, faster, consumer grade experience? And can we then play with things like our weird agrarian academic year? Like so many campuses go into low productivity for much of the summer. They'll have camps and other things and summer programs, but could we imagine a model in which we take our 12 months and say, those are four terms, two of those count for full time. And by the way, if you wanna be in the workforce in just two years, go around the clock for two years and get back the opportunity cost of being out of the workforce for two years if you stay for four. So those are all the complicated layered questions we're working through. So it's a big, it's a big lift to try to get to yeah. 10,000. Very interesting. Um, Obviously, some of this in the works already, and from my reporting, it sounds like a lot of this is being accelerated by the pandemic. People uh, are really starting to think about this more. Um, let me go back to you, Sam, if I could. So if the future of higher education is some sort of hybrid learning, part online, part in person, maybe to lower costs, what does that mean to you? Are you intrigued by this? Are you worried that students will somehow get a, a lesser product <laughs> um, if they have this mix? How, how does that strike you? Yeah, it's a really complex thing. I think personally, I'm excited to see the different opportunities that could come from um, the mixture of, or like the model of hybrid classes. I do think that with online classes, it does bring kind of back to previously what we've been saying is that um, what, is, does, what does it mean really for financial aid students? Um, what does that mean for their financial aid packages? I know during the pandemic, um, my school created like this organization called U Chicago for Fair Tuition, in which we were discussing how would tuition um, kind of follow uh, the models of learning that we're doing, going to Zoom classes, like it's not the same value necessarily. Um, and how are we helping these students who can't financially afford it? Um, how are we looking at the budget and how, how can we see these things and follow through with them? Um, I think it's a really interesting experience if done so with the ideas of students and the consideration of their backgrounds. I know with my, the organization I was involved in, we did get a tuition freeze, but even so, and looking into the future, we're thinking about, you know, how can tuition follow through? How can they help us if we're going to be going to these hybrid model classes and having to get apartments um, or having to pay utilities or rent? Like, we sometimes forget that in that all of those things, it's our first time getting an apartment. It's our first time doing all of these things. And so the universities have to take on this bigger role of not only just being an educational institution where we do as um, was stated, like the one job of being in the classroom and learning, but how do we also um, foundationally support that? So it's been a very complex issue. I think I'm excited to see where it goes, um, but I think it's definitely going to require um, looking at different models and also the engagement of students and their responses towards it. Yeah, interesting. Um, Amy, let, let me bring you in here. You uh, think a lot about economics, how families get by. Uh, what do you think this shift toward more online learning, more hybrid learning could mean for the price and value of higher education? How, how do you think about that? My hope is that it makes higher education more available to everyone. And that in that hope, I also imagine that the way that we provide higher education changes form. And I really like what uh, Dr. LeBlanc said in terms of the variety of scheduling, just this idea that you don't have to do it in one way and one way only. And I think that's going to be really important. And I, and I do believe that there are people that can make it in two years. I mean, you know, somebody that's totally focused and they have all the supports necessary, that's, that, has a, that has an appeal that, that uh, you know, even I haven't really even thought about it. 
At the same time, I would say that, that I do feel that that period of maturation, the leaving home, identity formation, socialization, um, world discovery, it's incredibly important in a person's uh, formative experience. It's a, it's, the, it's a controlled source of freedom, which is you choose what you're going to do and you pursue it, recognizing that there are bumpers, but you have a lot more control over it. But that costs money. And, it can, and, and I don't think everybody will go through the process in the same uh, way. And, but, so I think that there's going to be real serious issues associated with the financing of higher education. And, and the traditional model will work in some places and in other places, I don't think it will. At the same time, we do have to look at the last generation of uh, college students who are saddled with uh, debt now to the point where we can't even have a normal housing cycle. Right, you know, you don't have a normal housing cycle. You don't have a new normal family formation cycle. All of those things are really important for us as a society, and 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 they don't have it because they got caught in the moment when higher education was essentially being financed by parents' savings or by taking on debt, and that system just simply can't survive anymore. And it can't survive because the jobs aren't are not going to be there, and the the wage distribution of the jobs that we have are, you know, sixty percent of the jobs don't require a high school education. That puts you into the thirty to fifty thousand dollar bracket. So the the whole system is in some ways being challenged in terms of the need of uh, recalibration, yeah. and and so some schools will will be fine, but I think that a, a very large portion of people that go to higher education will will have um, difficult challenges ahead. Yeah, so lots of macroeconomic issues that get worked into college education, as always. Um, Paul, I want to ask you a, a little bit about kind of pure online education. As I mentioned before, Southern New Hampshire University has a huge online-only operation. Um, uh, it tends to be older working people who enroll in this kind of program, uh, looking to brush up on their skills, get ahead in the workplace. Um, do you see uh, growth uh, in that segment in particular? Do you see an opportunity here for college age kids uh, who might be a little leery of a kind of hybrid uh, on campus experience to jump right into that on online only um, pool? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, David. Um, typically online enrollments which cater as you suggested to a different demographic than the one we talk about with residential education. So our class, our traditional student, average student, no such thing as average, but typical student would be a 29 year old. 86% um, of them are working full time while enrolled with us. Most of them have kids. 18% of them have served in the military. 80% um, of them tried college. They come to us with credits, typically from more than one place. Any variety of things happen, life get in the way, you had a kid, uh, you ran out of money, whatever, you weren't ready, maybe you just weren't ready. So now they're coming back to complete that degree and unlock an opportunity. And it's hard, right? I mean, their first priority is their family and then their job, and now they're gonna squeeze in an education? That's really, really tough. So the things that they need from us look quite different than the things that a traditional student would want. Like when I think about that coming of age job, it's like, and you know, Amy so eloquently described this developmental piece. Our students in online, they've had all the coming of age they can handle. They know what they're about. They need convenience. They need like, can you give this to me in a way that I can consume? For them, it's very important that it's asynchronous. Like I'm gonna be a college student quite often at 10 p.m. after my kids are in bed and the dishes are in the dishwasher. And I'm gonna to tough it out and stay up till midnight or one o'clock because that's when I can get the time and the space to study. So what's happened now, and this happens typically with online enrollments for that population, is that enrollments are skyrocketing. So we, we just hired 200 more full-time people just to accommodate the influx of, uh, of students right now. Um, one example is that if you measure just inquiries, people sort of putting their hand up and say, tell me more. We, our inquiries are up something like 65% year over year right now for the month of July. So that's what happened back in 2009, 2010, 2011. The recession hit and people had to rescale. And remember that in the 10 years that it took us, and Amy's gonna be better than I am on this, so correct me, Amy, but in the 10 years or so that it took us to get back to pre-recession levels of unemployment, 65% of the people going back to work did so in jobs that did, they weren't working in beforehand. And if you look at the recent data right now, for the, we did a study of 900 recently unemployed adults and 65% of them, roughly the same percentage, said, I'm switching industries. 
I'm not going back to retail. I'm not going back to travel and, and hospitality, et cetera. I'm not going back to the restaurant industry. So there's an enormous impact right now on shorter term skills. So yes, they're coming back for degrees and those numbers that I gave you a moment ago speak to that. But when you look at the data, there's a real, there are a lot of people that don't have the luxury of taking two years to get a different master's degree or two years to finish a bachelor's degree. Like, give me a shorter term credential that gets me back in the workforce as quickly as possible. And the two areas that they're identifying again and again are healthcare and IT. Now, the second part of your question is, is this an opportunity for young people to discover online? They already are. So even before this, if you take a look at about the 130,000 students we have, about 30,000 of them are between the ages of 18 and 24. That's the classic campus demographic. But remember, going to campus is still um, not only expensive, but it's denied so many Americans. 50% of college students go to community colleges. They're not living on campus. Um, and, and so what we're seeing is many, many, many young people finding that it works for them. And the reasons are myriad, right? So it's not just more uh, a lower cost. Sometimes it's, it's convenience for them as well. They might have responsibilities taking care of their own family. We have 18 year olds who are the breadwinners in their families. You know, we work with homeless kids in LA County or DACA kids in, in the Rio Grande Valley they're quite often the source of sort of stability in their family unit. So we have to think very broadly about the variety and range of who we talk about when we talk about college. But you also, I think even as you talk about campus-based students, here's what we know. We're seeing the next wave of, of digital natives. There's a high level of comfort with being in virtual worlds. It's not a huge jump for them the way it would have been for a student even just 10 years ago. Um, and I think they intensely want that that campus experience that Samantha's recreating in her house. Um, but I think there's gonna be an increasing willingness on the part of students to look at a blend of things and a, an increasing willingness on the part of institutions to offer options in a blend of things. Well, we're already running short on time and I wanna to get to audience questions, uh, questions soon, but I wanted to ask you one more thing if I could. Um, uh, some of the, uh, as, as uh, Dean Brown mentioned at the outset, um, Online learning done well is quite different than uh, in classroom learning. It's not just someone lecturing over uh, over Zoom. It's really designed for that environment. Um, and we've got these online learning systems now where students are uploading assignments, downloading assignments, working together on various projects. And there's some really rich data there about how people learn. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just speak for a couple of minutes as to what we've already learned by observing these systems and how people are learning and, and what the opportunity is there in terms of learning about learning, uh, how people learn and, and, and how we might adjust our pedagogy as a result. Yeah, so I think our colleagues at MIT, those who are involved in edX, um, or Coursera, some of the big loop providers, they've been collecting massive amounts of data and probably been better than many of the traditional institutions at trying to understand what's going on under the hood or below the surface. Um, higher education, in my view, generally collects enormous amounts of data and is much less effective at making sense of that data. <laughs> so, you know, really being grounded in the experience of the learner. But I think, you know, when you think about how far learning science has come, we are learning a great deal about what it means to put people in online situations and environments and getting the thing that affords us that doesn't happen so easily on an analog campus is that when a professor closes the door, that's really all we get to see inside. But when I think of our students, we are measuring, we have 75 people in our analytics team that measure everything. How long people are on, when are they stumbling, what assignments are stumbling. So a nice example of this is we can go in and say, look at, we offer 500 sections of intro to, intro to psych. What happens in week four? Like everyone is stumbling in week four, something's going on there. And we now have the ability to look in in a way that you wouldn't be able to do. You, you wouldn't even actually flag that in a traditional campus. So you're right. It was very, very, we have a lot of power to do it. Now the question is, are we asking the right questions and are we collecting the data and thinking about that in the right ways? What the problem is, if I hope you're not asking, is what can we learn from the kind of online learning experience we had this spring? Because if you were designing a national experiment on online learning, that was the opposite of what you would do. Right. That is not what anybody wanted. Um, so we have to be much more thoughtful about how we construct that inquiry. Great. Thank you for that. Um, let's turn to audience questions, if we could, here. Um, naturally, we got a lot of questions from readers nervous about what's going to happen on campus this fall. Um, this is one from uh, Ellie Eckhoff. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, pretty important. 
would you send your 18 year old son to live on campus? Um, uh, uh, at the risk of going to Paul too much, he's the administrator here. I'm gonna start with him and then I'm gonna to get to some of my other panelists here. Paul, what do you think of? Like all complicated things, the answer is it depends. So we know, for example, that uh, the pandemic shone a light on great inequities. So we, even though our campus will remain closed in the fall, we are going to bring back students who have either housing insecurity or food insecurity or unsafe. Um, so that's kind of our line. And I think your readers might be shocked at how common all three of those things are in the life of undergraduates. Um, the, we've done you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education did a study last year talking about the levels of food insecurity. Students who literally weren't sure where they would get tomorrow's meal. So, so in that category, yes. I think there are questions of locale and then institutions are handling this in myriad ways. So if you are in a high infection rate area like parts of Florida today, not sure I'd send my student back. And honestly, not because the risk to them is so high, because the public health responsibility of not spreading the virus is so critical right now, which our country seems completely crazy about. Um, but those are the sort of questions you have to look at. A colleague of mine who runs a very small rural campus in an isolated part of the country, he's torn because he's thinking, I've got pretty low infection rates and I can kind of keep my camp, my campus is pretty isolated. But on the other hand, if I have an outbreak, I've got three ICU beds in the whole county. Like, what am I going to do then? So I'll, I know it's, it, everyone wants an easy answer on this. It's layers and layers of complexity. But here's what we know. We are running a national experiment right now, and it's in the form of D1 football programs. The results are not good. They're closing down one after another. And these are small numbers, very controlled situations from people who have a deep incentive to get it right. And they're still they're still not still not happening. So I'm a little skeptical, but people are really thoughtful presidents and chancellors are working really hard on how to make this work. Interesting. Sam, I want to ask you this one. We got uh, um, uh, viewer Leonardo Solis asking, uh, I'm interested to know how you see dorm life in the time of COVID now and for the foreseeable future. Um, Sam, you're headed back to U Chicago this fall. I, I think you yeah. told me that um, they've got limited number of kids in the dorms. Some people, including maybe yourself, will be living off campus. Tell me how you're thinking about what dorm life is going to be like, um, where students are going to live, how, how we should think about that. Yeah, I know as a sophomore now, I can get an apartment and I can have my group of friends who I trust and confide in. And we know we can make a plan together about how we want to be publicly safe about things and, you know, a, a plan towards, you know, keeping our responsibility um, as citizens to, like, keep the public health. Um, but I'm thinking of the freshmen and who have required housing, who need to get into campus. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, it, uh, college is like a time of me making new friends, but you also don't really know where they lie on, you know, staying quarantined or where they're going. And it's a very complex and honestly difficult to talk about conversation with someone you're just meeting and now you have to live with. Um, and I know in my first year, I lived in two doubles with a bathroom and a shower. And so you're constantly sharing these spaces. Um, so I'm thinking that, you know, dorm life, although we know the social um, situation is going to be different. And I know my social situation is going to rely on my roommates and us staying inside and looking for things to do together. Um, but I'm thinking about the freshmen who are going to be in like a completely different um, social setting and physical setting. Um, how that conversation is going to go down and um, yeah, just the complexities because there's already weird social cues in living with someone. Now you have a whole pandemic and it's going to be difficult. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Amy, I'd like to ask, direct this one to you. Uh, Daniel Zabo asks, uh, how to teach and learn in curricula where physical work must take place and be observed by an instructor? Chemistry labs, mm. robotics, construction, art, music, dance, med school, et cetera. I think a lot of folks are wondering about that. It might not be your specific area, but I'm sure you know lots of professors in these fields. Uh, how's that going to play out? Any sense? So a couple of things. First, um, in the global south, people have been using distance education for medical training for a long time. In sites of conflict, in places of, of disease or inaccessibility, there are uh, nursing programs and, and medical doctor programs that people are literally, they've got cameras coming in from different directions and they're actually watching surgeries. They're having people 
people that are actually following them as they're stitching. And so that part of that experience on an, in, on an intimate individual basis is, has been done before. I think of two things which I, um, uh, one I, I think is a solution, one is solved and the other one isn't. And so one is we have a lot of project-based courses and we, we literally, it's like a lab and you have to actually be there and there has to be somebody demoing things and then somebody watching you do what you're doing and then working in group settings. And uh, MIT developed a, a, a technology to actually take that on and, and execute it. So we're gonna demo it this fall and see how it works. But, but that was something that somebody dedicated a huge amount of time in a, in a maker space and had years of experience to be able to put it together. And knowing MIT, I'm sure they'll package it in some way for other people to access. What I'm more concerned about is, is the, the uh, uh, accidental education that takes place. And that was something that I learned from my students this spring. They, they, said one, they all said to me that, you know, the part, it isn't about this stuff, the class stuff that I'm missing or that I feel really bad about. It's the way I learned in every other moment of my daily life like you're going to class and you have a problem set and you couldn't get an answer and you bump into somebody and that person happens to be a whiz kid and sits you down and in five minutes they teach you what you're doing or you just walk by somebody you recognize them from another class and you make a point out of nowhere and say hey are you going to a study session and so there's so much of that interaction that's extemporaneous and it is it is un, you know, it's not something you can predict and so what I have this fantasy about is that we make a, uh, a virtual reality in which that can happen. And I can imagine students walking down the infinite corridor, stumble in to get a coffee, run into somebody, I, because I think that that part of learning in, in a tactile field is, is absolutely essential and it's done all the time. So we're, we're not quite there yet, but we'll see. If I could just add, David, I was talking to some of our faculty recently and, you know, I think there's so much focus right now, we get phone calls from colleagues and institutions who may have less experience in online saying, how do we think about this? How do we get courses online? It's like the faculty will do a great job. They're smart, thoughtful people who care deeply about delivering, but it's all of this other stuff. Like one of our faculty members said, you know, her son is a student with us. Like, but you know, one of the most, the thing he talks all about all the time was the car ride with Professor So-and-so on their way to a conference. And that conversation is the one that sort of redirected his life. You think, how do we do that? Right, like Amy's virtual reality campus might do it, but it's just, I know it's, it's hard. And then of course, it's all this, the sheer joy. I mean, four years on a campus for the luck, students are lucky to have it. It's four years of the best, I mean, it's the best four years of your life for many people. And it's just very hard to get all that back. And in some ways I would say, I worry less about how we'll deliver academics. And I say to my colleagues, you're gonna win or lose this on everything else. On that feeling of belonging, that feeling of affinity, the feeling that I'm part of a community. By the way, also your ability to support mental health needs, right? We took the generation of students with historic levels of anxiety and depression. And we just gave them a pandemic, a recession, civil unrest, and climate change, by the way, was in the background, right? Like it isn't getting better. How are you prepared for that? And as we move classes online very quickly, what about accessibility? What about students with learning disabilities? So the complexities are so much around the academics. I trust the faculty to get it right. Honestly, they're gonna, because they have integrity and, and commitment, can we really get everything else that's needed to make this work for people? And while we talk about the risk factors of bringing people back, we can't ignore the genuine risk factors of not bringing people back. I'm sympathetic to those who argue that case, even though my campus, I've made a decision not to open up. I'd just like to make one point that's really in line with this. What happens to health insurance? What happens to medical care that maybe for some students, it's the first systematic care that they've had. And, and universities provide a lot of um, care that we don't see, it's all hidden in the background. But, but my own view is as that students should be offered the same insurance program and those, those insurance programs should be accepted by care providers if we have any hope of wanting people to be able to conduct life in some normal way, because we can't just all of a sudden expect parents who may not be in a position to provide that type of support to be have that and then also operating in a low or medium income job. It just is going to be very, very tricky. A lot of equity issues here for sure. Um, 
I want to look at one of the live questions we just got. Those uh, that I just mentioned were by the folks sent in before the event even happened. We do have some live ones. Um, how will tuition costs be affected when you're only offering online options? We had a bunch of questions that came in beforehand about the same thing. This is obviously something people are thinking about. And I want to get to you, Paul, in a second. But first, let me ask Sam, just as a student, how are you thinking about this? Do you expect, do you demand lower tuition uh, if we're going partially or fully online here? Um, yeah, I, I think the students are demanding um, lower tuition. Um, I know some of the ways that have been solved for students has been um, offering, um, I guess, like subsidies or uh, grants of money to pay for rent, to pay for utilities. Um, but if you're not changing the tuition costs, you're being forced in a position where are you spending that money for tuition? Are you spending that money to be there? Um, or healthcare costs. So I think students, especially the organization I'm part of, um, UC for Fair Tuition, are really asking for clarity and budget and um, listening to the needs of students and by changing the tuition costs, essentially. So, yeah. Got it. Um, Paul, this was framed a little bit of a different way in one of the questions we got beforehand. Um, where do we see ourselves in 10 or 15 years? Will education cost less? Uh, will fewer people enroll, et cetera? Um, I know your school obviously is embarking on this initiative of slashing tuition. Where do you see the, the industry going as a whole? Because a lot of schools are under financial stress already. Uh, that will only be deepened with this pandemic. Um, do you see with the shift toward hybrid learning, toward more online learning, an actual bending of the cost curve? Is that going to happen? Um, it will have to happen because we are losing too many students right now. And we have shifted costs to students and their families to the tune of $1.6 trillion of debt, as Amy said. That's more than all credit card debt put together in the U.S. It's an astonishing number. With deep, long-reaching impacts, the long tail of that into the economy, and again, Amy would be better than I am about talking about what that means. So it has to, right? And if you take a look at, so for the first time, we had a serious conversation back in the primaries about free college. Now, the best work by the World Bank and the American Council on Education, full disclosure, I chair that board, is a report that says, actually, that isn't the way to think about this, but targeted is really important. Actually, free college actually can contribute to inequities, taking you know, re scarce resources and directing to people who don't actually need them, but targeted for sure. Um, so I think we have to be more affordable than we are today because we're simply out of reach of too many people. How will we get there? We won't cut our way there, right? Because this is, this is really larger structural questions. And we have an industry that was built for an industrial age with a model that people would go to school out of high school for four years, and that that would suffice. And that doesn't describe the world today, right? So we have to build a higher ed ecosystem that, is, that understands that people are going to have to go in and out some days, you know, I may get a two-year degree, I may get six months, uh, I may get into my first tech job and then scaffold and stack. So none of this is blue sky. All of these models are in the air. They're being implemented in various ways. A school like Western Governors has been able to drive tuition down with a nationally leading nursing program and a nationally leading teacher ed program to under $10,000 a year, well under $10,000 a year. We've got programs that do that as well. So we, we have to get there, David, because this isn't working. I would like think to about, If I could say one, one, I'm sorry, one last thing. Um, we often think about the out of control cost of healthcare. When you sort of go back to 1980, for example, and just measure that. There's the incredible outpacing inflation year after year, even though real wages have largely stayed flat. Higher ed's twice as bad. We're the one industry that makes healthcare look good in terms of cost control and cost generally. Um, one other thing to say is that as long as we end up with uh, the majority of jobs not paying a living wage, we are not going to get out of this pickle because parents are always, somebody is always going to be on um, the hook for paying for aspects of education. It was never completely free. And right now, if you look at the kinds of jobs that we're creating, we have to recalibrate what we mean by labor value. The model of determining what constitutes labor value today, as Paul suggested, harkens back to a time when dull, dirty, and dangerous were the defining characteristics for differences in wages. 
but we can't, that's not the world we live in anymore. We live in a world of psychological labor and emotional labor and socialization labor and problem solving. And yet we want to pay people $7 and 25 cents an hour or even $12 an hour. And it's just not worth it. I work with an organization in Massachusetts that builds uh, workforces for call centers and they're constantly being pressed to keep wages down. But the, the people that are asking for the workforces don't appreciate just exactly how much people have to do to be successful in modern jobs today. And we have to change the bottom wage and bring that up. And we have to also get employers to really recognize if somebody's going to put money into education, they should get paid for it yeah. when they're done. Yeah, I mean, it seems that, that there's a push and pull here. Uh, on the one hand, you've got these kind of macroeconomic issues you've got to deal with. People are going to afford college. And then on the other hand, you've got this push uh, pressure on the, on the campuses themselves to find ways to innovate and, and reduce the cost. Um, another interesting question here from a, a Stephen Cusisto. He says, I'm very interested in how post-COVID campus life might actually improve access for the disabled. I'm a blind professor and have been struggling for digital accessibility for years. So as we think more and more about online learning, um, what can we say about accessibility here? Paul, maybe your best position. Yeah, it's actually the American Association for the Blind that has been among the most active um, in pressing for accessibility with online learning. In fact, I think there was a pretty um, well-known case against MIT at the time. And MIT then sort of really took the lead in rethinking this. So we have a very large division just devoted to this question. It's one of the things I raised in my earlier comment about as schools think about moving online, they have to think about this. Are we going to actually lose ground for so many students whose disabilities will get in the way of their ability to be successful? Um, this, but you know, if you believe, as I do, in universal design, the things we do for students who have those sorts of challenges actually make the overall learning environment better for everybody else. It's the old curb cut analogy. Curb cuts are great for people in wheelchairs, but they're actually great for people pushing carriages and for older people who walk with a cane. It's just better for everybody. So I think this is actually an invitation for us to take universal design much more seriously in general curricular design. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here um, as we're running out of time. I just wanna mention quickly, there are of course many kinds of colleges, all of them impacted in different ways. I wanna mention that uh, next week on Wednesday, July 22nd, uh, Globe editorial writer Marcella Garcia will be hosting an online conversation sort of like this one uh, titled Community Colleges in Crisis, How COVID-19 and Race are Reshaping Higher Education. So if you haven't gotten your higher ed fill today, please tune into that. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn it back over to Dean Brown to close us out. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. This was a great conversation. Um, it was really helpful to hear Sam's perspective and the recognition that there are both pros and cons to the online world from the standpoint of the students that are experiencing it. Um, I really love the observation that Professor Glassmeyer made about the connectivity and intimacy between students and faculty in the online world. That's something that we hear all the time. Uh, and also this idea that uh, about accidental learning. And, and we've found that if you have virtual office hours and chat rooms and you make use of various social media platforms, uh, you, you can get some of that in the online setting as well. And above all, I really wanna endorse everything that President LeBlanc was saying about the ability of online to make education affordable, create greater access, um, and frankly, to recognize the fact that students of today and 20 years in the future uh, are not the same students that, uh, that uh, we've been educating in the past. So I really applaud what Southern New Hampshire has been doing and what they've accomplished. Um, and those same principles are what drives a lot of our innovation at GEE. So I wanna thank the panelists. Uh, I also wanna thank the Globe for sponsoring this and thank all of the participants for being here with us today. Um, and also just kind of encourage you to, to, to check out uh, some of the programs that we offer at GEESE as well as uh, programs offered by some of our other participants uh, and really see what it's like to uh, have exceptional world-class programs that are delivered for the online setting. So thanks everybody for being here today and stay safe. <laughs>